So, um, my name, as you noticed, uh, I'm not the uh, first author of this paper, I'm not Katarzyna, but as a co-author, I hope I'm going to do my best to present this uh, as she was, she will be doing, yes. So, the topic of the presentation is the recent contributions of the mobile GIS in the study of lead mining on the example of the Oronisco Lead Mines project. So, where uh, what is located? Orojsko is a small um, uh, commune in Poland between Warsaw and Krakow. And uh, internationally is actually known of two things. One is the art gallery, the uh, center of Polish sculpture. And the second thing is the mines, which was uh, discovered in the 1920s by famous Polish scholar uh, Stefan Krukowski. And this, res this area um, here, I'm just trying to... Oh, I'm not easy pointing out, but I use this, okay? This is the area here. This area was researched uh, quite a long time, and thanks to that we know about 250 sites in this, uh, in this area. And most of the research were done in this topic of the flint mining, uh, of uh, chocolate flint, and it's also, this is also the topic of this presentation. And uh, Katarzyna had this idea uh, in her grant uh, to study the northwestern range of chocolate uh, flint deposits and also to study the settlement uh, focus on the exploitation of this raw material. And she wanted to, uh, she wanted to have this attempt to reconstruct the methods that we used to um, uh, mine for mining this uh, raw material and all in the comment on this process of processing through the her project. And also she wanted to concentrate on the paleo environment and the, uh, study the relation about the mines, uh, quarrying workshops and so on. And uh, in her idea it was to use this interdisciplinary methods, uh, geological research, geo geophysical research and also uh, here a small part has the mobile GIS. Um, we were lucky to have, uh, enti for entire research area, the coverage of the LiDAR uh, and the catastrophe data in vector formats and also the uh, near infrared aerial imagery and, um, yeah, and some other things too. And the, the area of course is not very big, uh, it's just 80 kilometers, 80 square kilometers, um, but as, as I mentioned you before, it's packed with sites most of them are dated uh, to the period that are more or less related to the Flint. And uh, since the project was not really long, it's only three years, so we were not, not able to map all the sites. And the major concern was to study the extent of the sites, their chronology. And of course, we wanted to document this artifact, uh, all this landscape of Flint mining. And Katarzyna had this idea not to concentrate on the site themselves, but to the distribution of artifacts. And uh, so this was more or less off-site survey, so artifact-oriented survey. And um, <clears throat> our thing was to make this uh, strategy of field survey reliable in every circumstances, including the weather. In Poland, sometimes similar to, to here, as we have in, in Tübingen now. And we wanted to have this uh, open, open source or free, uh, so we didn't uh, use uh, any <coughs> expensive tools for fit survey. So we have only two seasons by, so far, and in that moment we tested several workflows, uh, collected uh, quite large amount of data, and uh, we started actually immediately after the research grant was uh, uh, accepted and all the papers were signed out, so we didn't have any access at first to any elaborate tools uh, for measurement, so we used at first handheld GPS. As you know, a handheld GPS it's not uh, a tool that you use for every uh, case, so you can only measure points and, and tracks, and it's uh, determined how we surveyed. And first we have this small research group, only professional flints, uh, specialized in, in flints or in GIS, 
And uh, since, um, as I mentioned before, we have this catastrophe data and all the survey concentrated on the catastrophes, so we needed to document the exact place where the field was uh, beginning and then where uh, it ends, so we make photos, make measurements, and also, uh, as you can see here, so we divided ourselves in two uh, separate teams, so um, in, in which were collectors who have you know, gathered material, packed them in the multi-use bags, and then the person with the GPS has labeled them, make a point, a measure. And also this is not entirely digital uh, workflow, as you can see here, because um, we use paper inventories, where we noted most of the things, including what type, uh, here is in Polish, but I have this translation mostly um, of most of the things. So what, what was important to make sure what is the accessibility of the area, yeah, uh, uh, what is the type of terrain, the soil type, and we have these ideas to document most of the things. And um, as you can notice, this is not a proper GIS thing, because this old titles had to be then uh, cleaned up in order to pack this in the GIS. And the workflow looked like this, so <laughs> at the first season. So, uh, yeah, so we import through the base scan, save as KML files, separate files, then, as you can imagine, we have to convert them to shape files, made a cleanup, uh, as some attributes, something to remove, we made a copies, some people also had to uh, rewrite everything in Excel, and then we'd use the spatial light, you know, it's a regular, very simple database, uh, we make this join, and it, it all came into uh, QGIS as artifacts. Uh, however, <clears throat> the thing is that uh, when you use such a workflow and you ask, import KML or GPX files, you get these attributes that have no meaning at all, just have no values or just sort of uh, colors, there's no meaning to GIS. And then also we noted that we have to be careful uh, what, how we actually save the date. When you just got this AM PM thing, it might cause that you that you have when you merge in data sets, you have to make sure that you actually it's comparable. And this work of is tedious. It's a lot of um, work because it's not you know, <clears throat> and everything in this thing was very messy, including the transects themselves. Yeah, this is the thing you, when you import, I think it's uh, more or less known to you, those useless attributes such as, for example, extrude visibility, draw order, nothing of really relevant. Yeah, and because we could not uh, view the data in the field, so we decided to use something to be able to, um, you know, orient, orient ourselves in the field. I mentioned you that we have the vector data for entire research area, but the problem is what type of tool can be, can be able, you know, to import all these polygons and to easily, uh, you know, turn them on after, for example, a crash or something. So everything took time. So we decided to use uh, WMS layers with cadastro parcels because we could temporarily save them as a base map and was enough. And uh, yeah, so we also use it uh, to measure an extra track, but um, uh, we did not use them entirely to collect data. So, um, as you notice, I am referring to the specific versions of the software, so not just any version of Locus Map 3, because it, this field is constantly changing. So, uh, at first they have these problems with or organization of files inside, and then this make a progress, also I'm, I'm testing the um, Locus GIS, so it, it, there's something different. And this is the first day, um, this is the main uh, area of the first day, as you can see here, it's a lot of uh, tracks, a lot of points, but this was caused by that thing that we had this bias by small trees, grass, so this was like experiment, you have to uh, walk very carefully. And also I use this uh, surface map with these buildings, with the nose, to, to indicate that you have, you know, trees, houses, so not just idealized landscape. Our workflow changed because we started to use Mobile Mapper 20 
and uh, also we have this uh, another equipment for uh, another purposes uh, for excavation and uh, auger drilling such as RTK and uh, total station but the thing is we also have uh, quite a uh, large amount of students so we could not make our workflow completely different and to experiment you know with something different so we decided to uh, keep it simple as it was before, but to use Mobile Mapper 20 as well. Uh, it's not possible to directly compare them because one of this is just a handful of GPS, and the second one is the uh, window. It's just a pocket computer. You can measure points, polygons, line. So it's complete. It's made a difference in this way, and um, but the problem is we, we decided to use the freeware app. And it's not easy to find a freeware app for such a tool because, uh, as we noticed immediately, uh, you know, Microsoft is withdrawing with this uh, operating system, the Windows Embed Handheld. So there's a lot of dependencies that you cannot find. So, or whether you use, you know, the specific software or choose something. And by the year 2020, it could be more problems with so this equipment, or I mean, in general, because it's already started that some uh, vendors have moved to Android uh, operating system in their professional equipment. We found the solution like this, it's a cyber tracker that helped us a lot to make sim similar and simple workflow. Yeah. It appeared that it could be used also for smartphones, but we did not we did not decide to use that for smartphone, and we uh, stayed with Locus Map Free. We also tested some other applications, but uh, yeah, I, we we decided that maybe the basic workflow would be enough. Uh, but I'm not telling that the bad ones it just they're okay. Uh, I did not decide to make this right, you know. Uh, mathematical case but we wanted just to decide whether it's appropriate for our workflow or not okay so that there was no major changes except one thing that we have um, big groups of the students and um, each of the group co uh, consisted of also the professionals that had led all the group of students there were photographers and uh, the major difference is that, that we uh, engage the students into the measuring, so they able to just uh, test the applications in the field to work for uh, two, at least two hours, independent from the situation and their uh, you know, willing, whether we will actually want to um, measure, so, because it's actually you know, a bucket with the artifacts and, and uh, GPS, so it's, it's actually hard work. Yeah. And our workflow changed because the cyber tracker, I know, I don't know if you know the software, possibly yes. So it's make this shortcut because it was no point to uh, make all those things here. And uh, this project um, that we found is quite interesting because uh, this, the team, the Liebenberg Lewis, uh, they had the idea to engage the local communities to map uh, um, environmental cases, the map uh, animals in, in Africa. So uh, they, they wanted to make this tool extremely, uh, uh, you know, um, with no problems. So it would be completely easy to use it in every way. There are a lot of already prepared application for that so I found something like that as you can see here there is a collection of windows when you move across them with tapping and to you can measure anything like here just you have this you know some some duck anything so we decided to uh, make something similar and because our uh, <laughs> uh, director we made this unicorn kind of uh, application with a pink color <laughs> Why JS has to be always serious? So the major thing when we change here is to make this auto increment values, so made it completely like Apple GPS, and uh, we were able to make transits. So the installation of the app is very easy, and uh, I'm not going to give you the exact tutorial how to do it on the Android device, but actually uh, the software gives you exact how to do it and there is a lot of videos for that and finally you get that uh, the, yeah the installation is successful and you can actually use it on your phones as well but uh, as I mentioned we did not yeah did it actually and um, yeah what is 
fantastic about the software uh, how do you download the data it's, there's no copying you're just pressing the button and that's that's all the data are already in the system and you finally have app, uh, attributes that has some meaning uh, including the accuracy here is 1.5 but there were different ones you have time and and date but the data is already spatial so you can see them and it's very easy to export them as shape files which is nice because you just write one name and you save both lines and points in one moment not just you know and also this is interesting that uh, you have multiple lines in one file because it's shape files so regular stuff it's not just like tracks but the thing is that uh, most of the data are strings so you have to convert them and make some cleanup for your exact database and uh, yeah and the, the coordinate system is not specified at the at first so you, but obviously it is the word geodetic 80, 1884 oh yeah so this is an example area um, as you can see the 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 pace that you can work with is comparable with the handheld GPS of course it's also the distance that we walked uh, the the length of the line and here also you know uh, use the to, to show you that this uh, wood here and so uh, the exact uh, location of sites is just a goal of our project to to make sure how is the extent so uh, we'll, yeah what the what there are uh, the primary um, my points of the pre presentation so when we use different applications there was a problem with merging the data sets because of the different data types and different attributes and the use of such applications as for example locus to collect was in when you compare them to cyber tracker it's very tedious very a lot of work actually and uh, okay cyber tracker gives this ideal workflow and uh, but the problem is whether to downgrade the uh, your professional equipment so it would only collect points and lines and also maybe uh, we should just use the smartphone instead of the professional equipment because but uh, and then the problem of accuracy appear with the two five meters for measuring artifacts it's not enough we would wanted to have it better and also um, what would the point of using handheld GPS then because it's complicated it's a lot of work okay so um, uh, maybe new workflow just uh, to use only the cyber tracker to use it on the smartphones possibly yes yeah, so of course starting with the preparation of another type of application not the pink one and then uh, using the um, um, multi-user database to prepare the QT forms for you know to put all the data I think would be uh, uh, interesting I, I hope we're going to move in that direction so uh, thank you very much for your attention and here are my main points of presentation I will be happy to answer any question if there are, and there are actually many, uh, a lot of time for that. <laughs>